What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller, and I'm here to help you get more clarity on what drives you and why, so you can upshift your life to go further and faster, but with more peace and ease. We are driven people who want to reach great destinations and achievements, but enjoy the daily drive so much we don't want to ever stop driving because every day is a success. That's the goal here. So in this episode, I'm with Thomas Curran to begin a series on perfectionism. And how we don't understand what it actually says about us and how it is sabotaging our drive. And this reason here, the purpose for this is to get out of the perfection trap. So Thomas Curran, he has a PhD in psychology. He's a professor in the Department of uh, Psychological and Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics. Uh, Thomas studies the personality characteristics of perfectionism, how it develops, how it impacts our mental health. He's got a TED Talk on our dangerous obsession with perfectionism. Uh, it's received more than 3 million views. You can go check that out. And his research has been featured in media ranging from the Harvard Business Review to New Scientist to CNN. Uh, Thomas's new book, which those of you watching the video can see over my shoulder here, is The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough. Uh, Thomas, thanks for being with us, especially as it's a uh, later in the evening across the ocean there. I'm grateful. Thank you. Absolutely. No worries at all. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was great. Ah, uh, my, my honor. You know, it's interesting that tagline alone. I mean, so the book's called the perfection, perfection trap that, that tagline embracing the power of good enough, good enough. I mean, right there. I mean, that's what we yeah. in essence don't want to accept, right? Well, average ordinary, these are dirty words right now. And I think that there's yeah. a lot of pushback, um, to the message, uh, when you say good enough, uh, the, uh, the next logical question is yeah but i want more but what if it can be better what if we can improve it and i suppose what i'm saying is that good enough doesn't preclude doing better it doesn't preclude improving in fact you can get more if you're able to settle and let things go and le learn in the process uh, but what it does do is it allows us to be happy and healthy and it allows us to um, enjoy like you said in the intro there enjoy the journey rather than focusing so much on an unknown destination, particularly if it's a lofty destination that we may never reach, but spend a lot of emotional energy trying to get there. Well, it's interesting. You just use the word settle also. I mean, it's another dirty word, settle. I mean, that's like the, <laughs> it's like the rally cry, you know? I mean, okay, you're over there in England, here in America. I mean, that's like, rock. you don't settle. You don't settle for second <laughs> best. And we've got all these days, right? Around that, that we don't want to. And it makes, it makes sense to think, oh, you know what? I'll just settle. And I mean, this is a, you know, we're in the personal development uh, industry right here. I mean, that's what I'm putting out. And that's the rally cries, you know, go for it. Don't quit. Never settle. And yet here we are saying, no, no, you'll be happier if you do. Fair? <laughs> yeah, well, you got to, yeah, look, we're exhaustible creatures. And at some point you got to land the plane. You can't keep taking off forever. And that's, look, and again, I, I have to be really clear here. What I'm saying is don't stop or, or uh, even worse, you know, just stand still or turn around and move in a backwards direction or anything like that what i'm saying is you can have goals and we can have aspirations and we can want to get places there's nothing wrong with that at all but what you have to recognize is that along the way it's going to be messy it's going to be chaotic sometimes it's going to be a jagged path sometimes we are going to slow down a little bit that's okay sometimes maybe we might stand still that's also okay things happen to us that are outside of our control and this is just life and what i'm trying to say with yeah. the message of good enough is that sometimes it's it is okay it is okay to settle um and that doesn't preclude high performance quite the, quite the contrary actually okay perfect i wanted to go right there with high performance because as i look at my own life to this point uh, so I, I'm 52. I'm about to turn 53. And there are some things where I'm looking and going, oh my gosh, I'm just tired. You know, that we had Arthur Brooks on the show and, you know, him talking about the second half of life. And there are some things where, man, I'm kind of tired of, to, of some of the aspects of building and innovating, creating. And I've, I've done a lot. I, I'd rather, you know, use what he calls crystallized knowledge and, and help lead with that. I don't always want to start mm -hmm. something 
uh, mm. new. But as you said, we're exhaustible creatures. I love that line. And but high performance, I do look and go, you know, the areas that I have mastery in, I want to master more. I want to master. Yeah. And that stuck out to me as I was reading the book to think, okay, it didn't preclude mastery. And I think about my kids and I want to tell them, man, master something. But if you're going to master one thing, you can't master everything. Is that fair enough as a depiction of what you're talking about? I think that's so crucial. Mastery is huge. But we don't think about performance in those terms, do we? Think about it in how many people are going to like what I do. Am I going to be recognized? Are people going to give me praise? Those are the criteria of success that today we hold in, hold up as things that we want to receive. Uh, and that, that <laughs> that's very different to wanting to improve, wanting to master, wanting to create something and leave something in the world for other people to use and appreciate and be inspired by. You know, that's that's a vocation. That's not about receiving a, a approval. And I think it's really, really super right. important. Uh, when we're having conversations like these is that it, this doesn't just, you know, it's not just about what we're doing, but it's why we're doing it. And if we're doing it for love, approval, to, to feel like we matter or that we're worth something, these are very perfectionistic beliefs, then that's going to lead us down a very dangerous path. But if we're doing it for the vocation, for the joy, for the, for the creation of the thing itself, then that's a very healthy way to strive. And, it's, and we know from the literature, from the research, that you're going to get way more performance in that doing uh, work and striving uh, for things that are bigger than us than we are going to do if, if we strive to try to compensate for feelings of not being enough. That That is great. And I want to dig into obviously the psychology of our self image and the issues that you bring up in your, you know, in your book and in your message. But it got me thinking again on mastery and thinking about, gosh, it wasn't, it's probably a year ago when I read a, a book on the life of C.S. Lewis, who I'm a fan of. And, yeah. you know, he was a master in his writing. He mastered, obviously, writing and storytelling and these yeah. things. And yet you go about the rest of his life, and I thought, it's pretty average. It's pretty average. He wasn't out to master everything. He wasn't out to please everybody. You know, him and J.R.R. Tolkien both, you know, but they, they, honed, they focused on their craft. They mastered that. And the rest of life, they seemed to enjoy for the most part, fairly well. And I looked at that and thought they weren't superheroes. They didn't yeah. uh, seem to be chewed up with, yeah, as you said, just pleasing every single person. And yet here we are. And as you said, like within the, the, the TED Talk, we have this obsession with perfectionism that we'll talk, talk about that, how we have, because I appreciated you. We've almost, well, no, as you said, in a sense, we've made it kind of like uh, where busyness became this badge of honor that now perfectionism is a badge of honor. And as you laid it out, I thought, oh, well, I, I don't want that to be my badge of honor, man. That is not a healthy sign. Fair enough. So, so tell us about that some. Yeah, I think you really it's really good that you bring up those creatives, right? As authors, I throw in another one, Margaret Atwood, very similar uh, psychology talks in in so much depth about uh, books and writing being just you know something that she loves to do and that just jumps out of the pages of Lewis Tolkien and Atwood you can tell um and then and then you have people like Virginia Woolf who is equally an incredible writer but her testimony is on the opposite of those individuals she tortured about her writing hate her writing would write things and then look back at it and instantly think it's the most terrible thing ever how could anyone ever write it she's incredibly tortured writer and this, I, I think it's really important that we we counter we 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 counteract these we uh these two examples because one striving for a very perfectionistic place one striving from a place of joy both getting to the same destination pretty much but one mm. doing it with so much more joy contentment and happiness and the other one doing it living life just completely depressed and worried and anxious and, and I think that's really important for people to realize because I think in modern society, we think that there's only one secret to success and that's self-sacrifice, self intense amounts of, um, yes. uh, you know, striving and pushing ourselves well beyond comfort. But actually, we can point to other examples where people aren't striving in that discomfort and getting exactly the same outcomes. And in fact, if we look at the literature, you can go one step further. We can say the data suggests we don't need to be perfectionistic. In fact, to be perfection is going to hold us back way more. It's going to carry us forward. And if we have a lower levels of perfection, we're going to get more success. So yeah. I think this is such an important conversation because there's a misconception in conventional wisdom that you have to be an excessively high 
striver to get to the top and that's just not the case but yeah you got me thinking back to victoria wolf of uh, there's almost this feeling of if you are going to be a a master a sensei a jedi or whatever you want to label it as you're almost supposed to be kind of tortured right you're supposed to just be your own worst enemy and to be your own drill sergeant and be somewhat tortured and to look at that and go, gosh, yeah, I, if I can, especially, I love your message there. I can pursue mastery in something and do it in a healthy way. And also, I mean, to, to, to my message, endo, enjoy the daily drive. I, I'm so aware now of how we can you know, go after that achievement. I've done it too. Go after that achievement. You spend years and years and years. And either one, what if it doesn't happen and you just wasted sure. all those years in turmoil and torture? Or two, you get there and realize, okay, that was great, but it didn't like solve everything of life. It it it, it go it points me back to going, man, it is not worth not having some joy in the day and getting past this cons constant striving for. And now let's go into that because what you showcased to me was it's a constant striving for approval, ultimately mm -hmm. either from other people or even to. Well, I wanted to ask you this because I felt like I, I see that in myself looking for applause, looking for approval, looking for praise, whatever out there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I, I can find myself doing it even just to myself. Like I've set my own standards that nobody's even going to see what I did. And I'm sitting there beating myself up about how I do something or how I achieve something that nobody's going to see. And I'm thinking, what again, why am I being such a drill sergeant with myself? So is that fair that sometimes we just do it to ourselves, even outside of public self-worth seeking yeah well what you're hitting on there is exactly what we see in perfectionistic people all the time when you ask them you know where does your perfectionism come from they'll say exactly what you just said it's from within i'm this internal drill sergeant i can't let things go and i i don't know but i imagine because i'm a perfectionist too when writing a book and i may perhaps you can relate but i was editing that to the minute detail to full stops and commas that nobody's going to notice but i can't let it go until i'm satisfied in myself that those yeah. things have been rectified even though it doesn't matter <laughs> it's just an internal thing so we see this all the time with perfectionists they just have this intent desire to do things perfectly but it's not only about those internal pressures there's a curious psychology in the perfectionist which basically says if i hold those pressures for myself then other people must hold them for me too and so there's a very deep sense that other people expect me to be perfect, just as I expect myself to be perfect. They're waiting, they're watching. And that's where the need for approval comes from, because we're trying to prove to those people that we we are this perfect person, that we think they want us to be, the thing we should be. And there's a third curious aspect of perfectionism too, which is perfection directed outwards. So just as I expect myself to be perfect, I expect you to be perfect too. And if you're not perfect, or you've put in a substandard performance, I'm going to let you know. And these are the three core elements of perfection you see all the time. Self-oriented from the self, socially prescribed, coming from other people, and other-oriented, projected outwards. So what you're, what you're describing in that psychology is precisely what we see in perfectionistic people. Goodness. I, and, and again, yeah, I'll call myself out that that has been... Well, you got me thinking. It's hard to even say it now that, that I have struggled with perfectionism, but I feel like what you're doing is showing me almost I want to take those words away. I have struggled with trying to achieve my own exaggerated expectations mm -hmm. uh, that don't give myself any any grace. And two, I've just been spending so much time trying to be perfect to other people and why. And I mean, from my own standpoint, Thomas, I, I know that my you know so much of my identity has been and still is, I'm working out of it, Thank you for being here. That's what we're doing here. This is therapy <laughs> is, is trying to work out of it and realizing that I want to be capable. I don't want anyone to see me as less than capable. I want to be able, I want to be fit and strong and intelligent, and I don't want to have a limit and I don't want to have an excuse. And that's what I built my identity on. It was great as a professional cyclist. You know, it served me mm -hmm. well in that role of master. I took it into everything and it hasn't, and it's created bitterness. It's it's hurt relationships with people. I've sabotaged businesses with it. And yeah, you again, and I, I, how, do, how do we say it? I wanna have grace for myself too, but to realize, man, that was not after some lofty 
desire to be the best in every way. Most of it was a lofty desire to not be found weak in any yeah. way. Fair? Exactly. And that's where perfectionism is really driven from at root. It's about deficit thinking. It's about thinking we're not enough. We're not good enough. We're going to be found out. So we have to keep going. I have yeah. to say, Kevin, you put you put yourself in a really difficult <laughs> uh, environment there with cycling. I mean, that's the toughest sport going, right? Like when it comes to the, the marginal, uh, minute uh, increments in performance that you need just to make it into the team, you know, it must have been insane to have to c compete in that context. I don't think you could do it without a little bit of perfectionism, frankly, because this is uh, just one of the craziest most brutal sports out there. so well, there's also the the environmental piece as well maybe you can talk to that kevin talk to that well first off thank you for knowing that because here in america cycling is not the biggest sport and they don't know what it what it takes so i appreciate that and yeah i raced over in europe where it is one of the uh the biggest sports out of there and yeah i would say it's a brutal sport in that and it was, and I, I wouldn't take any matter of fact, there's some aspects of if I could go back to my racing days, I would have devoted even more. I would have pursued perfectionism even yes. more in it. But that's that area that now you've got me looking at of that that was an area an area of mastery, and especially vocational, that I, you know, I want to do. Um, gosh, I want to be the best, you know, parent that I can in that role. So maybe there are some roles I, I do, but to look at life overall, that's where I feel like I went wrong. And I see others that we take that level and pursuit of mastery. And so I'm, I'm using that word mastery a lot, but perfectionism in something. And, and we try to take that into the rest of our lives. And, and, and again, I, it feels different. Help me, help me differentiate that because going after mastery, I did. I mean, I wanted to win. I wanted to achieve, but when I took the con some of the concepts into the rest of my life, it wasn't even about, I don't even know what the end goal was. It was just to not be found lacking. Yeah. I'll be found out. So, so let me ask you then, let me yeah. ask you a question. So when you hit challenge, when in, in your professional career, things didn't go quite to plan, how did how did that how did that feel like uh what was the response oh man in uh, in all truth I, I can think about when i first went to europe uh, i was you know doing pretty well here domestically then went to europe and got my butt handed to me initially and i was ashamed day one i was ashamed that's the first feeling yeah and we see this in the lab all the time. So if you put perfectionistic people into challenging situations, because you really find out like uh, what, what what's going on underneath perfectionism when they meet challenge. Because when things are going well, yeah, that's okay. It's fine. We could tick along. But yeah. once you hit uh, challenge and difficulty, that's where you find out. And we see this all the time in the lab. Like if you put people in, uh, we actually use sports. Sports are a really interesting conduit of, of competitive life because you can get people racing against each other and it's... Um, we set these ex labs experiments up where we get them on a cycle task and we race them off against in fours against each other. And then at the end, we tell, tell them they came last. It's just a nice way to manipulate failure, but public failure. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, it is a bit, yeah, there's a lot of swearing, but we do give them a detailed debrief at the end so they find out where they really came. But during the experiment, what we want to find out is what's the reaction. So what's the emotional effect of that defeat? And you see in non people that are very perfectionistic, well, it kind of hits them. Of course it does, you know, just finish last but yeah. uh you know they bounce back it's fine you go again and it doesn't really have a lasting impact but the perfectionist people is really you know you see massive plunges in pride huge spikes in shame and guilt and embarrassment huge off the charts you see it every single time so these these emotions this is why i was interested to know you know what's your first emotion it's really interesting you say shame because this is something we see all the time perfectionist people when they encounter setbacks and challenges they they really take it on themselves it's like a personal attack <laughs> When we know it's not, you know, especially in sport, I mean, you know, the impact of genes is so strong in sport. This isn't, this is just fate. You know, this is nothing personal, particularly when you're looking at uh, the marginal gains needed in cycling. I mean, look at Vinegard now. Is We've never seen a VO2 max of this guy and no one's going to come close, <laughs> not because they don't work as hard, but because they just don't have the genes, right? And so I think it's really interesting that we take everything so personally when life is so much more complicated than that. We could work really, really hard and still not make it to the top. And that's okay. That's just fate. 
Um, and, and perfectionists just cannot understand that. They can't wrap their heads around that. They're unable to see that there's a bigger picture and they take everything on themselves. So shame is a very big emotion. Goodness. Yeah. And you got me thinking about it's such a dichotomy. So here we are. I feel like in the culture right now, we have this drastic desire to say, can I just be okay? Can I just be okay? Can I just be authentically me and just be loved and just be okay? It feels like there's this big outcry. And then on the other side, we're living in a way that showcases that we don't even think we're okay. So like day one, can I just be okay with me? Can I look in the mirror and just be okay with me? And it's been proven at my age. I have proven what I'm good at and what I'm not. I can't hide it from anybody. My wife knows, my kids know, <laughs> my, my, my friends know, I, you know, that there are some things that I look at and go, yeah, just, I'm kind of mediocre at that. You, and, Cause you've got me wanting to accept good enough to some like skiing. So I live out here in Colorado. I live out in the mountains and, and skiing. Um, it's just never been, I didn't start it till late in life. I don't, I just go, I go a couple times, a few times a year, maybe where I have buddies who are, you know, gone every week. And I'm a mediocre skier and I have decided, you know what? I enjoy it. I mainly go to have fun with my kids. I really don't care to pursue mastery in it. It just, just takes more time. And I'd rather, I'd rather devote that to the stuff that I'm already good at. And I enjoy like mountain biking and trail running and whatever. So I'm okay with being just okay with that. How can I take that perspective? And, and, and like, it's like, I want to do an audit of my life, Thomas, and go, okay, what can I just be okay with being okay with? And you, you, you bring me back to that term of, don't ruin good with perfect. We say yeah. that a lot, but I feel like don't, don't don't ruin my life with trying to be perfect when well, I, I'd say that. So if I could have all these areas I could be I could be good at, have a you know, mastery here, maybe there, be good here, I can do that. Or I can pursue perfectionism and, and all of it and really suck it at all, in essence. Is that fair? Well, or at least not be is, happy, maybe. But this is this is the main trap of perfectionism. And and this is why I, I tied to my book, The Perfection Trap. Because the thing is yeah. with perfectionism is, you know, it, it exposes our dreams as nothing more than dead ends every single time. Because whenever we make a success and we overcome a hurdle, there's the next thing. And then there's the next thing. Because the better we do, the better we're expected to do. It's like chasing the horizon. The closer you get, the further it moves from our reach. That is the trap of perfection. So there is no satisfaction from success. Because perfection or high performance is par for the course. But when we fail, there's a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and a lot of embarrassment. So we're pincered between these two unwinnable games. They're trying to avoid failure on the one hand and shooting for a success that's never going to come. So we have to be <laughs> we have to be clear that perfect or perfection is simply not a healthy endpoint. It's not an endpoint at all. There's no destination to perfection. And that actually recalibrating our goals and accepting that sometimes good enough really is good enough that progress is way better than perfection. And if that means skiing for the first time, we're learning with our, and, we're, and we're enjoying it and with our kids and all the rest of it, like, you know, that's the level that we're at and that's what we're happy with and that's what brings us joy. That's the most important thing. And if it's the things in our lives that we do have a lot of mastery and competency in, then it's also super important to apply the same rules to, you know, like, Yes, it, it might be that in this domain it matters. Maybe it's our job. Maybe you know, maybe we're a very good athlete or a cook or a, or a CEO or whatever. Maybe we have made it to the top. But it's also just as important for those individuals to realize that sometimes it's okay to to accept that things are good enough and and that that's where progress is made, but but not perfection. Well, it's so interesting, Thomas. You just said progress is better than perfection because that's what i was thinking because you're not giving a message of saying overall just settle in life you know wherever you are just be happy there and and don't even try you know don't don't yeah. try to be the perfection uh perfectionist who's going from one thing to the next to the next to the next never satisfied you're not saying that you but I, you said progress because that's what i want to say i mean it is i do want to wake up every morning interested in something, making progress in something. And I mean, that's where we get so much satisfaction in life, but you bring me back, but what's my spirit behind it? Am I doing it for the joy of making progress for the benefit of doing that? But meanwhile, being okay with me, 
being aware of me. You actually say, I'm going to, I'm going to quote you. This is out of, it's all page 17 in your book. Well, I say that's the galley copy. So I don't know what page it actually is, but um, right at the beginning, you say to move toward perfection is to alienate ourselves from ourselves or worse to never find ourselves at all. But that's what I'm getting as the core of your book, that perfectionism is a way that I am in a, in a sense, just running or to, to my book title to driving forward with my hair on fire. And I am not aware. I am not present. I am not enjoying the process. I am, yeah. I am trying to reach an ideal that is either one unattainable or I might attain it, but at the yeah. loss of my own joy and soul in essence. Yeah. I, th I think perfectionism really is the escape from ourselves. When we, yeah. The, the what and what we're running from is is um a deep sense of of lack of feeling that we're not good enough we, you know yeah. there's there's a lot of there's a lot of psychoanalytical work that has been done in the area of perfectionism and time and time again what we see is people hold in our mind's eye an idealized image of ourselves a person that we feel we should be right we should be fit healthy yes. attractive not eating too much not eating too little working loads but also resting a lot of these shoulds are also very contradictory but this is how we feel like we should be and how we should live and what we should have and the lifestyles we should lead. That's our idealized image of ourselves. And perfection, perfectionism really tries to bring into coherence the, the conflict between that idealized image of ourselves and the reality, which is messy, chaotic, imperfect. The one, the reality that we're trying to run from. Perfectionism is gives us a golden ticket. It's like a, a glistening barge that carries us across that gulf between who we really are, the imperfect person we really are, and that idealized image we hold in our mind's eye, that's what perfectionism is. It's trying to bridge that gap. And that's why I say it's an alienation because it's really running away from who we really are uh, and rejecting the imperfect, flawed, but also beautiful and incomprehensibly <laughs> complex and uh, just unfathomably beautiful human being that we actually are un underneath every each of our skin. So it's... It, it's, it's it's alienation and that's why it feels so dispiriting that's why it feels so exhausting and that's why it can lead to some really difficult mental health problems because you would never ever ever are satisfied no, yeah absolutely well, let me ask you about another side of it and i had a therapist bring this up to me thomas it, it, within the past two years talking about it talking about perfectionism but not with this much clarity because I, I didn't i didn't conceive of it but it was looking at my dissatisfaction with myself constantly. I never measured up even in places. Well, with anybody else, I would give them grace. You know, if it was my, my spouse or my kid or my friend who was just really down on themselves in the way that I'm down on myself, I would, I would like, give yourself a break. Are you kidding? You're human. You're, you're incredible. Uh, I, I would give them grace, but I don't for myself. And what my therapist, so I'm going to ask you about this, what my therapist brought up, which I'm, I'm what I'm looking at as another side of this perfectionism is he said, Oh, so you think you're, you hold yourself to higher standards. You think you're better than everybody. Kevin, is that the case? You think you're better. You should do better than everybody. Everybody else gets grace for you for, except you, because you think you're better. And that sat me on my butt a little bit of, I mean, I didn't really conceive a feeling that way, but it kind of equals out to that, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose in a way, yeah, uh, I guess so. But in another way, it's also a, you know, perfectionistic people hold themselves to such a high standard, a higher standard than anyone else, because really their 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 core motive in life is to try to demonstrate to other people that they're worth something, that they that they matter in other words, or are loved, which is the same thing essentially. And that's the, that's the core. If you really want to get to the you know the root of this, that's the core of where these feelings are emanating from. We want to feel like we matter in the world and are recognised. And to do that, we feel like we have to project perfection into the world. Because if we don't, then what will what will we show? We'll show that vulnerable, flawed, um, imperfect self. And that's where the rage comes from. That's where all the self castigation comes from. That's where all the self criticism comes from on ourselves because we've screwed up. We've shown to the world a, a chink vulnerability or deficiency that we didn't want to show. Um, and as a consequence, how could you be so stupid? What were you thinking? Like these are the things that go through our minds. And so that's why we're really tough on ourselves in those moments because we are in control of that. We're not in control of what other people do. 
that's not within our gift. What's within our gift is how, how we perform. And if we don't perform to the high enough standard, then I, we feel like it's okay to criticize ourselves other people well you know mm-hmm. we, we give we give them the grace because you know that's that that wasn't in my control so therefore it's fine you know and and we give them a hand on a pat on the back and an arm around the shoulder and um and go on and look you know the reason why i'm saying this is because i 100 percent resonate with everything you say I, I do exactly the same things and i still uh am not fully uh, over these fears you know if i give a bad lecture i'm out of the lecture room but straight away thinking what was i thinking how do you why did, what on earth were you saying you know why do you ask a question like that you know i work on these things all the time but uh and my point i'm making is it's really tough because you perfectionism is really kind of knotty and gritty and it's difficult to fully eradicate so i uh, but it's, as far as i'm aware and, and my reading of the literature is that this that self-criticism comes from the, a place of wanting to feel like we matter and are, and are approved of in the world which again, put such a different light on it. So I want to bring up what you started the book with was the or or, or the concept, not the concept, the reality, I guess, that it's a very common, didn't you say it's a very common response in an interview when asked, what do you see as your greatest weakness that we now say, oh, perfectionism, not that we're just trying to not that we're being dishonest or anything but but we say that and again it can kind of come off like i have high standards right hmm. is, is that is that what no is i'm asking is that though what you is that why we tend to answer that way all the time now or yeah yeah i, th- I, th- I think we we live in a world that radiates perfection are they, you know look around you in social media in the in the workplace all we see is people striving 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 in universities colleges schools everybody's working to excel all the time is is super super important yeah you know, the only people we platform are the one percent the zero point zero one percent in fact you know the six sigma individuals uh completely improbable that any uh, of us would ever make it to that position but nevertheless those are, those are the standards that's how warped our expectations have become so i think of course it's very natural that in that context in that world when we're sitting in front of a person who is going to evaluate our criteria for, you know our readiness for the job and we're going to try to demonstrate our worth in a way that they think will be uh, well received. And of course, the natural the natural response to that question is, well, you don't want to, I don't want to give a weakness that's going to come off really bad. So I need to give a strength, but that comes off as a weakness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and what better? What better than perfectionism? What better? So I don't think it's any surprise we, we, we respond to that. No, it's not a surprise. I mean, I probably, I might have said that as well before I read your book. Now I'm not going to, because it feels like I'm in essence saying, oh, or, or the response would be, oh, so you struggle with perfectionism. I mean, you worry a whole lot about what other people think about you, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's not really what I wanted to say, but that would be, that would be more honest. I mean, that now that would be the honest statement to say, okay, what's your, what's your, you know, what's your weakness? Man, I struggle. I, so this would be honest. I struggle with being a people pleaser. So yep. I'm pretty averse to conflict. And when it comes down to it, I won't be honest about my own limitations or my own feelings. And instead I'll put, I'll, I'll push people away. Well, that's an honest answer to that. That would be more indicative though, of saying I'm a perfectionist. Is that, would that, is that, am I tracking? Absolutely. But one of the things I think is really interesting that people I think is really important to be made aware of is that actually there's something very connecting about showing vulnerability. So we have in our mind's eye this idea that we have to show bulletproof confidence all the time because that's what people want to see. But there's something disconnecting about that because when we see somebody perfect, somebody bulletproof, we can't relate. It's very difficult to relate because we know we're imperfect deep down. And and whenever I give talks now, I try as hard as I possibly can to show particularly younger students, graduate students, that I didn't know everything when I was at their position. And I still don't know everything now. And I've made mistakes in analyses and I've made mistakes when I was writing research papers. These are just things that are normal and natural parts of of any career. And there's almost like a sea of relief that you just see across the faces as they realize that this bulletproof professor has chinks in the armory. Mm-hmm. And so 
when we're asked that question, I think it's so important to be open and vulnerable because I think there's something intimately connecting about those moments where people can see, ah, this person is like me. <laughs> and and there's something that brings us together around those imperfections and vulnerabilities. And I don't and, and there's something very disconnecting about trying to project into the world perfection. So actually like it's it it would do well, it would do you well to be vulnerable, be open about those um difficulties because of everybody everybody encounters. Thomas, there you may know of this. There was, I mean, it's a long time ago, 20 plus years ago, I bet. And I read a study somewhere where the concept was they took two seemingly identical job candidates and they had a resume or an interview or something like that, but they tried to make them as identical as they could. The only variation is that one of them where the other one only showed the highlights and the good stuff. And like you said, the strengths, the other one shared some weaknesses. Other than that, they were identical. And the study was that the one who shared the weaknesses got like 55% more, uh, more success in, in, in the job, you know, pursuit or whatever, just because of what you said. And it stuck yeah. out to me. And yet it's not, it's it's not our natural bent to show that weakness or reality or vulnerability. And yet you're right. If you sat there and acted like you were totally perfect, I wouldn't believe it because I know better. And yet that's how I find myself coming off. It doesn't make any sense. I I know I would say it's it's not a natural um bent. I think um I think it's deeply conditioned into us from a very early age actually to manage impressions to make sure that you're succeeding or excelling at all times um and and I, and I think there's nothing more actual actually natural than for us to share in our vulnerabilities i just as, as i go back to the environment piece because i think it's so important i mean we do live in a world where the consequences of falling short or making a slip up but really catastrophic particularly when younger you know if you fail a test you're down a class that means you've got to you've got to basically past two two tests to get back to where you were so the consequences yeah. of of failing are really really severe which is why parents push a lot because they know that too which is why students get really stressed about exams because they understand this is really important and what we're doing is we're teaching young people that failure is really bad like really bad so you got to avoid that you got to avoid mistakes you got to make sure you put your perfect face forward and that just doesn't that's not just in school that's on social media too you know if you slip up on social media you post a a selfie for it perhaps that wasn't quite as manicured or whatever is another one people are going to let you know this is a cruel world we live in again these are the consequences of slipping up of showing a chink in the armory and if you learn that from a very very young age of course you're going to carry into the world a, a mindset which basically is very defensive and yeah, recoiling from situations where we might encounter defeat or failure um and and i think that's the reason why we try at all times to manage those impressions very um, assiduously uh, because it's really important for the way we receive. Uh, but the moment someone breaks ranks, right? The moment somebody step puts their head a little bit above the power pit and doesn't do that is the moment we suddenly breathe a sigh of relief. And so I think, you know, as a society and the culture is on us really to break through this conditioning and actually say, you know what, screw it. It's so important that we just show all of ourselves and all of our fears and all of our vulnerabilities. And we were, I think we'll live in a much happier, contented, and more connected world if we're able to do that. Man, it, you've got me thinking. So I've, I've got a bunch of kids, Thomas, and, you know, looking at them and I've got some kids who have excelled dramatically academically. I've got some kids, you know, who have excelled in, you know, some sporting events. I've got some kids who have excelled in the performing arts uh, and whatnot. And yet whatever is most applauded, if they don't do that, they tend to think of themselves negatively. And, and I find myself coming back and going, oh my gosh, but look, you're, 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 people love you. You're kind, you're generous. You're all these things, but they don't applaud that in school. You get applauded for your grades, for your sports yeah. results, for the standing ovation. And there's not an applause for being kind of like that, being good. You get, you get praise for where you perfected something, where the mastery is. You don't become, you don't get applause for being a good person, for being consistent, uh, for showing up 
you know, uh, on time. You, you don't, you don't get that. For having in, a go. In school and, or having, or giving it, thank you for trying. Fair. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. You gave it a go. You totally bombed it. Complete failure, but you gave it, that's, there you go. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you, okay. I got a question for you. You brought up a study that I had heard long ago. This is right out of your book. You said a classic study found that more than 90% of professors rate themselves as above average teachers and two thirds believe they're in the top quarter. The math doesn't add up. <laughs> so here's my question. Let's go to that. 90% of professors rate that, That's you. That's, are you in the 90? Are you above average Thomas as a professor? Uh, oh, I, uh, you're, you're, oh, I, <laughs> oh, what a question. I, I can't say yes, but I, 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 I suppose the reality is I am. Yeah. Uh, just by virtue of the fact that I'm at an elite institution would, would put me in that bracket. But I, as I say, I wouldn't ever consider myself to be an above average. I would consider myself to be very fortunate, lucky, and have I've worked hard and managed to just about get there. But I don't know whether I'd say I'm in the I probably am. I don't know. Well, it's a no question. end question. I know, well, you you are because that's what I'm asking. Because you know, do do ninety percent of professors really think they're above average, and does that speak to a you know a pride issue or or whatnot, or is it just an impossible question? Because if you're asked that, you don't win any points by saying, no, I think I'm pretty average. Well, then you're not going to get, if you came out publicly on your resume and said, no, I think I'm an average professor. Well, you're not going to work where you do or at Harvard yeah. or whatnot. It's almost like you have to. So the question I, I guess I have is, do did those 90% really think that they are above average or do they just feel like I have to respond? Yes, that I am. I mean, it, it's a bit of both. I think there would, there will be some pride in there. I think there will definitely be some, um, uh, optimism bias, <laughs> uh, confirmation bias of maybe their immediate surroundings and don't necessarily look more broader than that as well. Like, I think we maybe compare ourselves relative to where we are, um, which is a smaller pool than to measure ourselves relative to where everyone else is. And that can also impact on the way that we perceive ourselves. Uh, so I think there's a lot of that, but I also think you're right. There's a lot of social desirability and this idea that, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to consider ourselves in the top 10% in our field, because if we don't, then the next time a job comes around and we want it, then we ain't going to get it because somebody else will come around and tell us that they're in the top 10% or they're in the top 1% or whatever. So it's a race to the top, uh, as, as I tried to explain uh, many times in this conversation, but also in the book, you know, it's it's a race that's unwinnable, but nevertheless, it's a race we're all running. Well, it's interesting. I'm thinking about it with myself. So, am I in the top? You know, per, am I better than average as a podcast host? Well, you know, there's four million some podcasts, and so with the amount of downloads I have, I'm technically in the top one percent. But when I put myself alongside my peers and look at the podcast rankings, I feel pretty average. I mean, I, the, the, the difference between me and the very top is gigantic. I mean, there's people who get as many downloads in for one episode that I get an entire month with 16 episodes. And even that is humbling. I mean, there is some reality to have to look at it and go, gosh, I, I don't know. But, but am I, I guess, what's the other question then? Am I achieving my goals? Uh, it's, it's a good full-time job. I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. I mean, there's things that I am, but I don't know if the measurement stacks up to where I would try to be perfect. What do you think? Well, that's, that's exactly what you have to hold on to because there is more inequality in the 1% than there is in the 99%. <laughs> you know, the differences okay. as you get into that realm are huge. And there are, there are, there are a handful of very, very big winners. And this is, doesn't just podcast world. This is every world. Uh, in modern society, a clutch of extremely, you know, huge winners, not just big winners, like gigantic winners, you know, billionaires uh, who are just so, so far away from everyone else. It's, it's ridiculous. And of course, if you're in that orbit, it's hard to look backwards at the 99% and think, actually, I'm doing okay, <laughs> because you're seeing mm -hmm. the road ahead of you, which is filled with people that are so much further away. But that's just a consequence yeah. of modern modern society. Uh, modern society is fractured. Modern society has become a lot more unequal. You know, it's like in the post-war era, when inequality was low, the, the average Joe was a celebrated figure. 
you know, the Flintstones, the Jetsons, these were the average guy <laughs> was, the, was the everyday hero because that's the people that we celebrated in modern society. Now it's the Kardashians, now it's the zero percent, zero one percenters, now it's the CEOs. Now we have a completely different set of expectations of where we should be. And of course, they're completely warped and they create a lot of expectation, unrealistic expectation. Um, where the outcome that we're striving for is completely improbable. And I think that is a story not just of individual psyche, but that's just a sociological story of how societies have changed over time, how the, how the compositions become different, and how our expectations of, or, or what we think we should be in those societies has become completely warped. And so I've got no, you know, I've got complete sympathy with you because it's exactly the same in my world too. You know, as soon as you get into this world where people are publishing books and, you know, you've got the amazing high profile professors, you know, the Adam Grants, the, uh, the Angela Duckworths uh, of this world, you know, they are so, so, so far ahead in terms of sales, in terms of acclaim, in terms of clout and impact that, you know, you think you've made it and then you look and you're like, ah, yeah. You know, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot more to do. And by the way, just to say, um, Angela and, and uh, Adam are, are awesome people uh, <laughs> and I get on with them really well. But yeah. but nevertheless, my, my point is that you go into this world and, and you realize the levels. It's interesting. I had not thought about it, Thomas, till you said that just now that I mean, we all know that social media has caused a lot of issues with comparison and expectations and whatnot. But what you just made me think of is we used to have that concept of being a big fish in a small pond. You know, you grow up in your town and you do things and it's, it's pretty cool. It may not be globally, but in that small pond, it is, we don't have a small pond anymore. No. Nobody does. If you live in a town of three people, you have social media and you're compared with the best of the best of the best across the globe. That didn't occur to me. That's kind of depressing. Yeah. I don't know if I'm grateful that you help me see that. It, that's hard. That's hard. It's, it's an impossible. Yeah, it's a, it's impossible. I think it's, I think it's particularly hard for the young people because they've grew. They have to grow up into this. Because yeah, you know, when when I was younger, and and I'm sure when you were younger too, like the only people you're really in competition with are the people in your local community. <laughs> and I come yes, from a small town. Exactly. Yeah. I come, totally. I come from a small, small town, so there wasn't really much. <laughs> Like, you know, there was the, you know, of course there was this playground politics and, you know, uh, it, it wasn't an easy ride. Don't get me wrong. There was all sorts of things that happened, but nevertheless, it wasn't a hard ride either. And I just feel sorry for young people because not, you know, they have to compete with this kind of global world now where they're just, they're just wired into the mainframe and they're after having to compete with people, not just in their communities, but all around the world. And that's going to be tough. It's interesting because again, I'm thinking about myself and if I looked at it and go, man, I, I'm, if I looked at my town, of course I live in a really small town, <laughs> I, I'm doing really good, you know, as a, as a podcaster, as a personality, if I looked at the, the next biggest town, Colorado Springs, probably also really, really good, but I don't, I look at Apple podcasts and Spotify and look at the rankings there and all I'm irritated is, man, I'm not even in the top 200, you know, during this day or whatever. And you're, you're right. It, it's, it's, uh. That is, that's kind of devastating. And yet it is the world that we live in. We, I don't know, what, then what's the antidote? And we just kind of have to, well, as I say, let it go or come back to what we talked about a minute ago. You have to just realize what are your, are you achieving what you want to? Is your life good? Is your day good? Even if it's not as good or as somebody else, somewhere else by comparison? I think, Kevin, look, you've got, what you have to do is two things. Recal first of all, do it for the joy. That's the first thing. First, before anything else, you've got to do it because you love it. You know, you love talking to people, you love finding out new information. And it's clear you do because we're having such a great conversation and I can tell that you're really getting a lot out of it. And I am too. So I think there's definitely the joy of the, the, doing the podcast, which is so important. But the second thing is we've got to recalibrate our expectation. Like, we ain't going to be Joe Rogan. Joe, you know, yeah. there's, <laughs> you know, Joe is a great podcast, but at the same time, you have to understand that he's also been incredibly lucky to make the break when he did. He came through at the right time when things were picking up on the scene. Like if he'd come through a couple of years later, he would be like some old dude in a garage with a microphone. Like it sometimes it's just circumstances of things happening at the right time at the right being in the right place at the right time. And there's nothing you can do about that. Again, it goes back to this idea that it's just fate. So I think we just need to also recalibrate expectations. We're not going to be like a 
four, five, six sigma individual. That's completely improbable. But what we might be is get one standard deviation above or two standard deviations above. And that's success. That's still an amazing success. Um, and if you get three, let's say you get into the peloton, <laughs> you know, that's incredible. Well, you probably four or five if you're in the peloton. But still, that's incredible. Like just getting there, even though when you're there, you've had might feel like it's a struggle. Just getting there is such an incredible achievement. And it's like, you know, this podcast, getting into the 1% of the pod, sometimes you just have to recalibrate like what is success within a more realistic yeah. frame frame of reference and try to like di- like remove the noise because some there are some uh, benchmarks that are completely impossible. Well, not possible, but improbable. And you know what? If you do get there, celebrate it. But it's also about recognizing that you probably won't, and that's okay. Well, it still speaks back to where you know you've helped define what perfectionism is, because even in in that you talk about the peloton, so talk you know cycling as a reference, I I achieved being a professional athlete, a professional cyclist, and yet my frame of reference within that professional realm was that I was very mediocre, and and I had to have other people like my brother come along and say, dude, you you were a pro you made it you went to europe you did the stuff and all i did I was compare it. myself it's you know i came up alongside lance armstrong i didn't do that uh i didn't i didn't win the well you know aside from the drugs and whatever but still uh <laughs> you know, I, I i didn't make it to the i didn't do the tour de france people ask that once in a while so did you do the tour no not even remotely close but yeah that we tend to just minimize it according to the best of the best of the best and not looking at that you know, you made me think a minute ago too about yeah. like Hollywood actors. So when I was a kid, we oh, I know why it is because the new Indiana Jones is coming up, right? Uh, or, or just came or came out not long ago. And so my family we went back and said, okay, let's start at the beginning and watch the initial ones. And one thing that stood out to me is Harrison Ford back then. I mean, he was the heartthrob, he was the sex symbol, he was the leading man, and he was just kind of a lean dude. I have more muscle than he does now, but now today. Huh. I'm compared to Thor and every other leading guy who has like 50 pounds of muscle. Everything's everything's increased. Back then, it would have been you know such an anomaly. You had Arnold Schwarzenegger; he's the muscly guy. Everybody else was regular. Now today, everybody's this big muscular Hulk that I can't hardly compete with. But yeah, everything has gotten exaggerated, and the exaggeration is this a fair statement? The exaggeration has become the norm that we compare ourselves to. That's right. That's exact. That's exactly what ha- what's happened. We've we we've, we've lived in an exaggerated reality, where we only platform the only people. The only people we see as like people that are celebrated in the world are people, as I mentioned, who are complete unicorn achievers, which is yeah. great. We can we can learn some things from these people. Don't get me wrong. But Malcolm Gladwell wrote an amazing book called Outliers, and yes. the basic thesis of the book was that you have to be really careful. <laughs> when you're extrapolating from these amazing experiences that this is what it takes to be successful because there are so many other factors that go on underneath that aren't discussed that are equally important you know we're talking about cycling but genes are so important to getting to the very very top you know, in cycling you have to have a you have to have a vo2 max that is of an elite level otherwise you just doesn't matter how much you train you're not going to make it. so this is this is just a fact of life um circumstances happenstance so social background you know knowing the right people having the right family connections particularly in the uk we have a very class-based society and uh, where you start typically predicts where you finish there are also basically what i'm saying Kevin, there is a, there are so many factors outside of um you know hard work and work ethic and all the rest of it so we we live in a world we platform these people all we hear about is their experiences but i do think we have to be very careful about extrapolating from those experiences that that's what it takes to be successful because we could do all those things and still not be successful nothing nothing because of our efforts but just because that's just the way the world is and we didn't quite make it so it's i think it's it's really about recognizing that these expectations are warped and from there being able to reframe what is success um and uh enjoy the process because you know it's so important, as I say, that we enjoy what we do. We have a vocation. I, this is so I'm so important to impress this. It's got to be about something bigger than us, and we've got to we've got to find a way of uh, not worrying about you know how it's received, where we are, how much approval we've got, how much where we rank. Because these things, you know, are secondary to the enjoyment uh, and the vocation. So it's, uh, that that for me is like the big switch up from 
a perfectionistic mindset to a mindset that's focused on growth and uh, development, learning, and all the rest of it. Enjoy. I, I thank you. I love you saying that because I, I look back and go, what what gives me joy? I mean, it, it does to to do well and to progress, but the yeah. perfectionism never has. All it has no. done is cause me grief and and doubt and disappointment and dissatisfaction with myself, often in the face of other people saying, I, I did great. It was wonderful. Or, or, or just saying, you're, you're okay. I still love you. I still like you. Uh, I don't know how many times my wife has said, Kevin, when I'm lamenting about something, it just proves that you're human. Well, yeah. I, that doesn't help me at all as a, as a, as a staunch labeled perfectionist, I don't care. I don't want to be human. I want to be superhuman, which interestingly, Thomas is right out of your book. You said perfectionism is the defining psychology of an economic system that's hell bent on overshooting human thresholds. I, there's a superhero. What are the movies we watch? Superheroes. Man. We want somebody who, like you said, it's not even, they don't even get credit for it. Spider-Man should get no credit. He got bit by a spider. He should have been more careful. Uh, and yet he got bit by a spider or, or whatever, uh, you know, whatever superhero had got, you know, fell in a radioactive vat and became a superhero and they're supposed to get credit it's just for that. And <laughs> thank you. It's just careless. Or, or like you said, it's they just, you know, they won the lottery, they got privileged somehow. And yet that we're, we're, we're looking at, I love that hell bent on overshooting human thresholds. That is the glory. Even, I mean, not, not the discount of it, even like that. We, we're not, you know, earth isn't good enough. We need to go to space, which I say that that's not fair. I, mean, I know my, I know people dear to me who are in, involved in space program and, and it's great, but it's an interesting depiction of, we got to go further. We got to go faster. We got to do more or we're not, or we're not happy. Yeah. Got to keep moving. Got it. I like, you know, by the way, can I just say, this is an economic right. system that served us extremely well, right? Where we are today is down to the advances that have been made by rapid growth, which has come from this very mindset of, you know, doing better, keeping moving, making technological advancements, for forging new frontiers in different areas. It's what we enjoy today in terms of the abundance that we have in the technology, the fact that I can talk to you from across the ocean on a podcast yeah. almost in real time. I mean, this is just incredible advance. Yeah. But we also have to recognize that uh, there comes a point <laughs> where the link between growth and human prosperity starts to weaken. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing mm -hmm. um, economies continue to grow, but people um, not becoming happier. In fact, if anything, the reverse, life expectancy is declining in the US, sadly, poverty is increased. Uh, uh, a drug addiction is on the rise, uh, whilst simultaneously the economy is growing. Um, so we have to, I think, switch our focus a little bit on uh, uh, human prosperity rather than just economic prosperity and recognize actually it's just as important that we look after social development, educational outcomes, uh, employment, healthy life expectancy, uh, happiness, all of these things that are really important for us as humans to flourish within society uh, that are just as important right now, if not more important than economic growth. So I think the I think it's so important we recognize that this has been very good for us, but now we've got to a point where we've kind of almost outgrowing and we need to recognize this, uh, the switch our focus on people. Uh, and so that's really kind of, I suppose, the main conclusion of my, of my book. Well, that's an incredible anchoring point. I mean, it brings up Thomas to me, even the not to, not to criticize it, but as we see right now, the, huge focus on AI and what it's going to do and what it can do and what it may do. And I look at that. That's a great depiction. Is it going to be about growth, cultural growth and, and, and global growth? Sure. Is it going to help human prosperity? I'm not convinced. <laughs> Your thoughts? Well, I write about this in the book because I think it's crucial. I think it certainly can. The thing is, what we're going to see with AI is an increasing amount of our work taken away from us. Right now, uh, John Maynard Keynes, an economist, uh, British economist, uh, about 80 years ago, wrote, wrote a letter to his grandparents, basically uh, his grandchildren. And he basically said, by now, 
Uh, we, advancement in automation and technology and robots and AI and all the rest of it will be so advanced that we'll barely need to work at all because all the productivity will be done for us by machine. So we have so much more time in our communities and our homes and all the rest of it. Like that was his prophecy. He was absolutely right about automation and the advancement of technology. Bang wrong about the fact that it would be used to free us. It wasn't used yes. to free us. It was used to give us more work to do. <laughs> and this is yes. the point. But why is it used to give us more work to do? Because the economy has to continue growing. And that's a choice that we have we have to make with AI on, on around the corner, right? It's going to take a lot of jobs, a lot of white collar jobs. It's going to take them, and we have to we have to figure out whether we're going to let the productivity gains go to oh. corporations, pro, uh, businesses, and all the rest of it in terms of share, uh, in terms of dividends and profits, or whether we're going to spread the gains, the productivity gains of that of those technologies across people, so that we can enjoy more times in our communities uh, and with our families. But that's our question. And so I, I see AI as something that can be immensely enlivening, can give us back so much time in our families and our communities to do things we love, or it can be a dystopian nightmare <laughs> where it makes us all unemployed and uh, the, the, the profits from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from, uh, from our jobs being lost go to companies and all the rest of it. So it can go either way, but that's up to us to choose. You say... It's, it's interesting as we culminate this to look at it. And yet even, even now you, you did it in the book and you did it today and you described yourself as a struggling perfectionist. What is your, define that for yourself. So Thomas is still a struggling perfectionist because what, because what is it that you're still struggling with? Because I feel like I have to continually keep going, proving to myself um, that, you know, I belong here, that I'm worth something, that, uh, you know, um, I I have value. Um, and also to other people, you know, I <laughs> I feel all the time that I've got to people please, but I, I suppose I'm a, bit, I'm a bit like yourself in that respect. And I feel like there's always uh, somebody that's, you know, relying on me. Uh, to do well or to succeed, particularly like my family, who put a lot of um, a lot of emotional support uh, into my academic journey, I feel like they I owe them a lot back, and so I'm always striving, I suppose, to make sure that I stay here, like that I don't goof up and suddenly find myself unemployed. Uh, and so there's always that sort of, do you know what I mean? There's always that sort of like scarcity that hangs underneath me because I'm, you know, I'm I'm one. Uh, uh, firing away from you know being ha not being able to pay my mortgage and having to move back in my parents and the rest of it so even though that's completely ridiculous there's always something at the back of my mind that thinks you know just keep going you've got to keep performing you've got to keep proving yourself cause it's so so important uh in this in this society um and so that's why i emphasize the environment in my book because yes it is personal there's definitely a genetic component to it but it's also really hard these days <laughs> like to stay afloat. And, uh, and so there's, there's, there's environmental pressures as well that we have to, we have to bear in mind. Well, thank you. Well, I'll, let's, we'll get more into that in part two here as we talk about what drives you and some of those aspects. But uh, man, I'm so grateful for your work on this and for opening my eyes to this issue, Thomas, that I have not perceived well correctly. And it gives me the equipping to get out of it and to take a deep breath and look in the mirror and be okay with myself. So I just thank you. I'm so excited about this, this series as we dig further into it again, folks, the uh, Thomas, his book is the perfection trap embracing the power of good enough. And it is one to work through and consider. That's what I found myself doing as I underlined, you know, to consider what am I doing? How am I perceiving this? How can I get out of the perfection trap. You can find everything he's doing at, uh, it's Thomas, last name is C-U-R-R-A-N.com. Thomas Curran, 
com. Go there and you can find everything he's doing. And if you want to uh, check us out on uh, YouTube or on social media, find yeah. me at kevinmiller.co. You can watch this whole thing on YouTube, which a lot of you guys have been doing lately and leaving comments there that I can respond to. Thanks for doing that. Leave a rating or a review on Spotify and Apple podcast, if you would. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive and to uh, take his book and avoid perfectionism first and then get my book as well, What Drives You on Amazon. And until next time, folks, stay driven. Yeah.